Hi, my name's Julie Calverley. I'm really happy to be here today at the PNLD conference to talk to you about NAC, a nonverbal effective care community interest company. We exist to support the emotional well-being of children and adults with severe and profound learning or intellectual disabilities. I'm so grateful to Joe for inviting us to take part. It's just fabulous to be part of such a, a wonderful community which is growing um, worldwide. I always feel like working with the people that I get to work with, I'm so fortunate. I think we get to work with the most um, sensitive and um, some of the just the loveliest people in, in our society. So I'm um, delighted to be able to play a, a small part in that. So um, what Joe's asked me to do is give you a little bit of a, a tour of the NAC website. So that's what I'm going to do. And um, whilst I do that, I'll tell you a little, little bit about why and how we set up and and what we're doing currently and perhaps what our aims are for the future as well. So um, let's get started. Um, here I'm showing you the, the homepage of our website. So um, we really wanted to create a warm and welcoming place for people to come to, to find information about this area. And the motivation behind that was realising that for us to be able to provide good emotional care to other people, we need to be emotionally nurtured ourselves. So um, I felt like it was really nice for people to feel like they were coming to a website that was pleasing to the eye and perhaps feeling like a little bit of escapism from some of the stresses of day-to-day -day life. So try to use lots of really beautiful images to, um, to help us to get a sense of that. And another thing about the images that we have tried to select for the website is they, they should all be ones that are achievable for people with severe or profound learning disabilities to to be able to access themselves. So you'll see here this picture of nature shows that um, the path that you could get through. So if you're in a wheelchair or requiring any other form of assistance with mobility, um, this, this could be somewhere that most people would be able to, to access. Now in a bit, I'm going to show you a range of guidance that we have available on the website. This is all free for you to access. And it, the how-to guides, how to provide emotionally nurturing experiences to, to people that don't require any special equipment and don't require any specific training. We set up last year and um, this was during the pandemic. And, and at that time, it felt like what was possible to achieve was gathering together these pieces of guidance that help people to know what type of experiences and strategies they can offer within their own homes and services to people on a daily basis. However, what we also realise is it's really important that people have the skills and the understanding to underpin the facilitation of those experiences so the people we're thinking about with severe or profound intellectual disabilities are very much reliant on the way that we facilitate an experience and that's what will determine whether it will be emotionally nurturing or not so actually going back to this picture here and thinking about perhaps a lovely walk in the park that could be emotionally beneficial and nurturing if the person supporting an individual on that walk were interacting with them in a positive way and being really responsive to their communication attempts and to their needs. However, it wouldn't be so emotionally nurturing if, if that person wasn't engaged and if they were perhaps distracted on their mobile phone and not really interacting with the person being responsive to what they were showing them. So the skills and the understanding and perhaps the principles we could say that underpin all of the guidance on the website really, to me, they're the most important. So we're going to have a look at that in a, in a moment, but just to see what we've got on the rest of our homepage, we've got access there to the guidance and also to the research and evidence that underpins the guidance. So all of the guidance that's on the website has been selected because there is research evidence to show that that type of experience can be beneficial to our emotional well-being. Now that research has been carried out on people who don't have learning disabilities. But our argument is that if it's good for people, why wouldn't those things be good for somebody with a severe or profound intellectual disability, as long as, of course, that individual's needs and wishes have been appropriately assessed and that we continue to be alert to and vigilant for all of the signs of communication that they're giving us to determine what their wants are and what their needs are. So our vision is for the emotional and mental health needs of children and our adults with severe and profound intellectual disabilities to be recognized, cared for. And this is about using the latest evidence in neuroscience-based practices. So as I've already said, there is good research out there now to show us that the things that we can do that involve our body 
that involve senses and our interactions can be hugely beneficial to our emotional well-being. And so these things we often incorporate into our daily lives and we might consider them to be self-care practices. But for the people we're thinking about today, those people are going to need support from us to be able to access those kinds of experiences. So it's more about how can we adapt those to be suited well and appropriate for that group of people. And throughout the website, you'll have access to these eight categories of experiences, which we're going to have a delve into in a moment. So these categories, arts and creativity, interactions and relationships, mindfulness, movement, music, nature, senses and touch. These have all derived from that research evidence that tells us that these things can be beneficial to our emotional well-being. This is about promoting good emotional well-being. It's not about assessing and treating when someone has a mental health problem. So the guidance that we're providing is not a substitute for clinical assessment and treatment and where we have concerns about our individuals. Mental wellbeing is really important to seek that specialist support for health and advice. And the guidance that we provide on the website is suitable really for anybody who is supporting somebody with a severe or profound intellectual disability, but also others who may support groups of people who use other means than words to communicate. So this is taking practices that are good for our emotional well-being and adapting them so that they're suitable for people who don't use words to communicate. So this might also include people with brain injury and um, people with dementia. And our, our guidance can be used by family members and, and carers and education staff and people in social care settings, um, healthcare settings, and therapists, um, like I say, anybody who has a role to play in the day-to-day -day care of somebody with a severe or profound intellectual disability or somebody who uses other means than words to communicate. Um, so let's have a look. At, um, I will go on to show you the guidance and have a little delve into some of those categories. But as I mentioned, the most important thing for me on our website is this area here, the principles underpinning your guidance. And you'll see throughout the website, this pink box pops up all over the place. And that's to remind you to just check back and have a look at this page and make sure that those things are, are covered and supported in your own practice and, and by your team's practice. So let's have a, have a look at this page. So some really important principles here that underpin the use of all of our guidance. And the first here you'll see is um, we talk about use of consent and understanding informed consent and a recognition that for people with severe or profound intellectual disabilities, gaining informed consent to participate in the experiences that we're offering might not be possible. So what we can do instead is think about this term implied assent and how we can observe the person's non-verbal communications and cues and signals and interpret them as what they're telling us about whether that person is assenting to what we're offering or saying no, dissenting to it, saying that they're, they're not comfortable with it, they don't like it. In that case, we really need to be responsive to that, stop what we're doing or change what we're doing to ensure that it's, it's suitable and, and that the person's happy with what we're offering. There's a whole section there that explains that and gives you some pointers on how you might be able to, to ascertain whether someone is approving of what you're offering. And that needs to be done experientially, so it's about them having a go, trying it, being exposed to it, but us really staying vigilant to their all their signs and signals and cues that are telling us yes they're happy with it no they're not happy with it in which case we do things differently and there's also some information here about how we might observe assess and record the impact and outcomes of what we're offering and you'll also see within each piece of individual guidance each experience there's some ideas and prompts there for the kinds of things that you might consider and look look for to be able to observe, assess and call for what those impacts and outcomes might be. There's a little section here. I was really keen to put this, um, this in because this has come to light a lot recently thinking about what, what do we actually mean by emotional wellbeing and making sure that we understand this concept in, in its entirety and not be too oversimplistic with it. It could be easy to think about emotional wellbeing as being um, something about making people happy and providing them joyful and pleasurable experiences. And I believe, yes, that's absolutely a part of emotional well-being. But actually, we need to look more broadly at what emotional well-being is about and recognise that all emotions are there for a reason. We experience all emotions, whether they're good or bad, for very often good reason. 
and therefore to make sure that we incorporate that into our definition and understanding so that people have proper opportunity to be able to authentically experience all of their feelings, including those that you might find more difficult, and also to be able to express those feelings and share them with others. And um, so if someone's sad and crying, for example, um, it's that's an absolutely kind of normal reaction to many things that take place in our life and ensuring that that person is able to express that and be responded to, to, to know that it's okay to feel that way and that we actually validate that, that emotion and that feeling and support that person to process that emotion um, before just trying to kind of move them away from that emotion and, and get them perhaps to feel happier, which, which really will result potentially in that person just internalizing those more difficult emotions and feeling like they're not able to, to express those or even have them. So really making sure that we allow people to authentically experience and express all emotions, including things like distress, anger, fear, anxiety, because they're all part of being human and being able to experience and express them in safe ways and supportive ways is, is all part of having good emotional well-being. And just moving up on the same page, there's also some information about how you actually can use the guidance. So um, we've been really clear here that um, the guidance, though you don't need special training to actually put the guidance into practice because it's all laid out in step-by-step -step instructions, um, it is really important that it's facilitated by people who know that person well and are able to recognise and interpret their non-verbal communication sufficiently that they can pick up on those signs and signals when the person might not be happy with, with what's going on. There's also information here about how you can create these collections of guidance. So you can set up a free account on the website and this will enable you to develop eight collections for eight different individuals that you might be supporting. If you're only supporting one person, you can just create one collection. We're going to have a look at that in, in a little while, but just to let you know that there's some guidance on here about how to actually use the guidance. So do have a look at this really important principles underpinning page. Um, so in that guidance page and on the same page, you've got these principles underpinning your guidance, and you can access that with pink button. So look out for that on the website. And so let's move on now to have a look at that guidance. Um, and here it is. So you can access the guidance through different pages on the website when, wherever you see these eight circles. And all you have to do is click on one of the circles. So let's just take one. Um, let's go for the, the nature category. So I'm going to click on the circle. And you'll see then that will take us to a page all about nature. So within this page, we have got some different experiences that could enable you to provide uh, or facilitate an emotionally nurturing experience for somebody you support, um, all related to, to nature. And underneath, you'll also find some information about the research evidence that underpins this idea that we can use nature to be emotionally beneficial. Um, so you can have a look, browse through. So let's have a look at um, getting closer to, to wildlife. And you just click on that piece of guidance and then that will pull up your step-by-step -step guidance and instructions, a little bit of an introduction and then some information about what you need and what to observe, assess and record. So the idea is that each of these pieces of guidance is really simple and easy to, to follow. You really wanted to achieve something where you feel like you can pick it up, have a read through, maybe read through a couple of times and think, yeah, I, I can give that a go and, and try it out. But they should be safe to use if you use some of the training and understanding of what you could be supporting. Um, see how it goes, see what kind of impact those experiences have on, on each person you're supporting. If the person likes it, do it again. If they don't like it, look at how it could be adjusted or changed, or don't do it, do something different instead. We'll see as you seen in the previous page let's go back to that there's lots and lots of different experiences you can choose from so it's about picking what works for, for each person you're supporting and let's have a look at uh, which one the images of nature one here. so click on the images of nature and you will see again here's the guidance so there's a little bit of an introduction sentence or two and then some information about what you actually need to gather together and these should all be things that you've got easy access to and that aren't expensive and then again the step-by-step instructions on how you can actually facilitate that experience on many of the pieces of guidance there's also links to other websites where you can find video information or video guidance on how to facilitate that experience 
giving them some ideas about what to observe, assess, and record. Um, so let's go back to let's go back to the full guidance page again and maybe have a look in another category. Let's have a look at let's have a look at, at movement. So I've clicked on the movement category, and here again you find a variety of experiences that use movement to promote emotional well-being. And underneath some ideas and information about the research evidence that underpins this. Some quotes. So helpful when you're thinking about needing to be able to show to perhaps the organisation you're working for why you're doing what you're doing. There's a lot of wealth of information here that really helps to, to provide that evidence base for the practices that you're, you're using within your services. Let's talk about the health benefits of movement, not just about the body, but also how our mind body is so intrinsically linked that what we do with our body really has a massive impact on our emotions. So for people who aren't using words to communicate, this provides a really good opportunity for us to support them with their emotional well-being because there's things we can do that involve the body and how people experience their bodies that can really benefit their emotional and mental well-being. And that involves things like movement, but also posture and how we're positioned um, can have a really profound impact on, on how we feel uh, in ourselves. Okay, so I'm now going to show you how you can go about um, developing a collection of experiences for somebody that you're supporting. So you've already set up an account and that's really easy to do. You just need your email and your name. You don't need to include the name of the person you're supporting. So that, that doesn't need to be your name at all. We're going to go to collections and you'll see here that I've already created two collections for two different people. Um, rather than put names in them, you just need to choose either a picture or you can choose a colour to identify that particular collection. And you do that by clicking on create collection and then it pulls up this list of identifiers for you to choose from. So we've got a whole range of different pictures here, um, lots of animals, items from nature or colours that you can use to create collection. So let's set up a, let's just create a tiger collection. So you literally just click on the plus, say you'd like to add the collection. And then you go, you've got a new collection that's titled tiger. Um, and then in order to actually add pieces of guidance to this, it's like creating a collection of favorites um, here. You just click on add more guidance. And then you can go back and browse through those pieces of guidance again through those eight different categories and choose which ones you want to include in that person's in that person's profile. So if we have a, have a look in the mindfulness category, and it might be for this particular person who we've given the tiger collection to, but we think that having assessed their needs and assess their preferences and so on, but actually some form of mindfulness experience could be beneficial for their well-being. So we could um, maybe have a go with a supportive body scan and then we just add to collection and then we would click on the tiger, click there and it would show a tick and that shows that you've added that piece of, of um, guidance to that person's collection. Um, so here's some I've made earlier already just to show you what that would look like. So with the pink collection, you can click on view collection. And here you'll see pieces of guidance, experiences that I've added earlier on. So this kind of creates a menu of well-being experiences for, for an individual. And this includes things like using, sharing experiences as personal stories and see themed musical soundscape and creating Creative painting and card making, so artistic activities is also things about communication, it's so important for our emotional well-being. Dance activities, um, how we can use touch to support emotional well-being and, and lots more there too. Uh, and then if you find the person likes it, keep it in their collection. If you find that one's not working so well, then just delete it from their collection and, and try something different. Drawing upon an idea that I think we all have a range of things that we do to support our emotional well-being on a daily basis but the people we support are relying on us to provide that for them. So these very much these are things that you know, I might integrate into my daily life when I go for a walk in nature. I don't necessarily consciously think about that as supporting my emotional well-being, but it absolutely does. With the people we're supporting, we need to be sure that, we're making, that they do get access to those kinds of experiences too. Um, okay, so moving on to, let's have a look at some other areas of the website. 
we um, have a look a little bit more about, about NAC as, um, as an organisation. I can tell you a little bit more about who we are. Uh, as I said earlier, we're a, a, a community interest company. We're called NAC, which stands for Nonverbal Effective Care. And um, we operate in a not-for-profit way. So everybody who is working with us is working in a voluntary capacity at the moment. We started out by developing these, these pieces of guidance and tools and strategies and practices to support emotional wellbeing. And what we're looking at more now is how to actually support the implementation of those through our training. So we've started developing training programs. So do have a look at those and, and do come along and join us on some of those training programs. We realise that that quality of the experience a person receives is so much going to be about the skills that a person has who's facilitating that. So let's make sure that we really provide enough support to enable individuals to be able to deliver that kind of effectively. Let's have a look at um, the team and, and introduce you to some members of, of the team that we have on board with NAC. So you've met me already. I'm the founder director at the moment working um, with the organisation in the voluntary capacity as is everybody who works and works with NAC at the moment. We're hoping to be able to, to move on from that and to be able to gain more resources to be able to develop what we're doing more and, and disseminate it more. But at the moment we're, we're operating in an entirely voluntary capacity. Um, we've got Karen, who's our practice development director, and Dav, our financial director, and this is Annabelle, our, our director and um, accounts and bookkeeping lead. And in addition to these people, we have a wonderful team of collaborators who support us in a whole variety of ways. So do check out this page of collaborators and you'll get a sense of kind of the vast range really of skills and experience that people are bringing to the organisation. Um, we'd like to have some more family members involved, so do get in touch with us if you would be interested in, in joining our team, because it would be, be lovely to have more, more family members involved in the team. And we also have this group of people who I describe as the professional advisory panel, our, our NAC app. And these are people who check the guidance, so every piece of guidance that you see on our website has been checked by at least one of the people on our professional advisory panel. So these people are there to check for primarily for safety to make sure that the guidance that we're providing is going to be safe for people to use, but they're just generally quality checking it. Do get in contact with us if we can help you. We do provide training and consultancy. Um, we can do that in service, we can do that online. So we have a whole variety of methods and, and uh, models by which we can support organisations. We're also currently developing a new website which will have training and learning resources on which you can access online so watch out for that and on that note if you want to stay in touch with us then please do sign up for our e-newsletter so you'll see that link under the contact menu sign up for an e-newsletter you won't be bombarded we send just one or two newsletters a month but that way you can keep in touch with anything new that's taking place any events we're putting on and any training courses that are upcoming so finally, I'd just like to extend an invitation to any of you to get involved if you'd like to. There's a whole variety of ways that you can get involved with NAC. Um, we'd love to hear from you if you have an idea for a piece of guidance on an emotional well-being experience that we could include on our website. Um, if you'd like to give us some feedback, if you've used the website and you've got some feedback to give us, we'd be really grateful to hear from you. Um, do follow us on Facebook and Twitter and um, LinkedIn um, if you use those platforms too and um, some other ideas here about how you can get involved with volunteering, becoming a director. Um, lots and lots of research projects need to be carried out on this work to further our understanding of what we're doing too. So we just need to go to the top here and click on contact and then you will find a contact page and your email will come directly to me. I'd be delighted to hear from you if there's anything you can do to help or indeed if you would like to get involved and, and help us too. Thanks ever so much for listening. Take care, enjoy the rest of the conference and we hope to see you soon. Bye.